Hey church, it's so good to have you join us for our night service. I hope you've had a great week and I hope you're coping well during this lockdown. Well, tonight you're in for a treat. We have Pastor Joel Ramsey bringing the word and I hope you're ready. Uh, Pastor Joel, alongside his wife, Savannah Ramsey, have just been appointed as the location pastors of City Point Nashville. Um, and I, I know he's going to be bringing us a great word tonight, so I hope you guys are ready. But before we hear from him, City Point Worship has just launched a new album called Behold Collection One, along with some apparel. So click on the links below in the chat if you want more info on that. But without further ado, why don't you lean in, grab your notebooks, grab your pens, take as many notes as you can, and let's get ready for the word from Pastor Joel Ramsey. And uh, we'll get into it this morning. Ephesians 5, chapter 3, this is what it's, uh, verses 3. It says this, But among you, speaking to the people of God, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. The book of Ephesians is, is speaking to Christians. Uh, it's important to understand that we, when, we, when we talk about this, we're speaking about it in the context of what God's Word says for our lives, okay? This is speaking with God's people, those who have surrendered their life to Jesus. And although there are principles that apply and can help people who don't follow Jesus, this is God's directive Word for His people, okay? But among you, God's people, there must not be a hint, hints, not a lot, there must not be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 says, Flee, we all know what flee means, run away, escape, get out of there, run for your life. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you, know, sorry, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have received from God? You are not on your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. We have to understand as believers, our body is no longer our own. We have been bought with a price. When we surrendered our lives to Jesus, He paid a ransom for your life. Your bodies are no longer your own. So with your body, with your physical body, the Bible says, honor God in all that you do. Now, when we talk about sex, it obviously gets a little bit awkward. Some people get sweaty hands. You know, when I, was, I said in the last service, you know, when you're a teenager and at a youth camp, they start talking about sexual purity. You know, if you're not really living in sexual purity, you get real nervous that your girlfriend might get convicted and stop. And then so you're getting awkward and you know, all those things. No, just me. A lot of this is gonna be just me went through this this morning. Uh, I'm sure of it. And, uh, I, but the truth is there's also a lot of shame around the topic, there's a lot of embarrassment. And truly that's a result because of sexual immorality, because God's plan for sexual intimacy and activity was never for shame, was never for pain or embarrassment. It was always to give glory to God in our bodies and in our lives. But to help just sort of lift a little bit of the shame this morning, there's a couple of things I wanna uh, just say before we get into the, the, the meat of this message. Number one is this, that sexual sin or sexual immorality is not the unforgivable sin. It's just not. Number two is this, if we, if we can be honest, by a showing of hands, I don't want participation here because in the last service there were some super pure people. Uh, if you have in any way, shape or form in your entire life, in some capacity, fallen in the area of sexual sin or sexual immorality, just raise your hand for me, anyone? Just have a look around everybody's hands. Yeah, there's, again, there's a few really holy people who are like, never. I haven't done that. Um, and those people, they're going to be writing books. I said they need to do seminars uh, because the truth is, I would imagine 99.9% .9 of people have fallen or erred in the area of sexual immorality. The reason I wanted to do that is just to remove the shame. The, the, we make mistakes, right? The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, okay? Losing your virginity uh, before marriage is not the worst sin that you could do. It is, yes, we're gonna talk about it, not God's plan, 
but it's a sin like any other sin, and that sin is forgivable through the blood of Jesus. Uh, you know, we, we have to understand this. Adultery in marriage is not the unforgivable sin. It is the same as any other sin. It ha- can be forgiven be- through the blood of Jesus, amen? And so real quick, just to remove that stuff, people mess up. That doesn't mean we're supposed to continue to live in sin, but we make mistakes and sometimes we think, you know, guilt and shame comes from you think you're the only one, how embarrassing if somebody knows, et cetera, et cetera. Just, let's just get shame out of the way for a minute this morning so we can look at the Word of God, inspire people in the Word of God to live better, holy lives because the Bible says there should not be a hint <laughs> of sexual immorality among God's people. Amen. So what I wanna look at real quickly then, if the Bible says that there shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality, among God's people, or it says that you should flee from sexual immorality, then we probably need to define quickly, generally, what sexual immorality is. Now, sexual immorality comes from the word, which is pornea, uh, fornication. And, and obviously, you can do deep studies into this. If you want to get deeper into the word of pornea, well, then the Andrew Staggs would be a great Bible college class, I'm sure, somewhere along the way. Or just ask Pastor Chris Hodgman. He'll tell you everything you need to know about pornea. But essentially, sexual immorality is any and all sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Sexual immorality essentially means any and all sexual activity outside of the context or the covenant of a marriage between a man and a woman. And the reason we need to understand that is so that we, when we look through Scripture and God's design as we're going to do, that when sexual immorality is going to come up a lot, and we need to know what that is, and it helps us put that picture of sexual immorality is any and all sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, when God gives us directives in the Bible, there's a few things in the Bible He tells us, do not do this, or He gives us clear statements like, flee from sexual immorality. There shouldn't be any coarse jesting named among you, also in Ephesians, for any of you people who love your rude, crass jokes out there. The Bible says there should be no coarse jesting named among you. It's funny when we find these passages of Scriptures in the Bible. But anyway... He gives us these things. He builds parameters around our lives not to uh, rob us or help have us not experience good things. God gives us directions and boundaries for, I believe, generally for two things. One, to protect us from something worse or to preserve, oh, sorry, and to preserve us for something better. You know, to protect us from something worse or and preserve us for something better. I, I gave the example before that, you know, I, I like cheeseburgers. Now, not McDonald's cheeseburgers. I like real, proper American cheeseburgers, right? But if God said to me through His Word, Joel, do not eat cheeseburgers. Flee from cheeseburger eating. It would be for reasons. One, to protect me from a condition called obesity and or diabetes. And to preserve me to have a really wonderfully athletic figure, which clearly is working for me. And, uh, and so, but he, this is why God, he, he wants the best for our lives and He wants to protect us from the worst of our lives. And so He says, flee from any and all sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage, not to rob us from something good, but to protect us from something worse and to preserve us for something better. Amen. So this morning, I want to go, number one is this. What is God's plan and purpose for sexual intimacy and sexual activity? I'll read this passage of Scripture in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 4. It says, Haven't you heard? This is speaking of what was spoken about in the book of Genesis. It says, Haven't you heard? He replied, That at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, man will leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. God's design for sexual intimacy and activity is supposed to be reserved for the marriage bed. 
The Bible tells us in Hebrews that let the marriage bed not be defiled. So it's, it's reserved for the marriage bed. And all through Scripture, the New Testament and the Old, sex is only ever celebrated or we are only ever given directional uh, etiquette around sexual activity within the context of a man and a woman in marriage. Every other time that the Bible speaks about sexual activity outside of the context of marriage, it's not celebrated, it is condemned. So God's plan and purpose for sexual intimacy and activity is reserved for the marriage bed, okay? Amen? The second thing is, in, in this, is this, is that uh, God's design for marriage is between a man and a woman. Now we are well aware within culture and the world that we're living in, that scope has broadened dramatically. But God's design, God's plan and purpose according to His Word is that marriage is uh, reserved for a man and a woman. We, uh, we just read it before. In the beginning, God created them male and female. And He said to them, for this reason, man will leave his father and his mother and be united and become one flesh. God's design is for man and a woman to be in marriage. We read in the book of Romans 1.26. It says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust that even women exchange natural, this is the key word here for God's plan, natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their Era. God's design for sexual activity and intimacy is reserved for the marriage bed. The marriage, God's plan for marriage is between a man and a woman. Now, before I continue, I just want to say this. I am, we are well aware that we live in a world and a culture where people struggle with their sexuality. Anybody else aware of that? It's important that we just clear up quickly. The struggle is not the problem. People struggle with sin. There's a desire. Some people have what we would call same-sex attraction. And it's important for us to clear up. Although they have a desire, and maybe you're in the room in, in this morning and you're hearing this, but although there's a desire, part of following Jesus is that we deny the flesh, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. The, the goal of Christianity is not to purge yourself of all your sin and all your mess so you can come to the saving power of Jesus. The goal of Christianity is to come to Jesus as you are with all your sin, all your mess, surrender your sin and your mess and your life to Jesus so His saving power can do its perfect work. Yes. I, I, just, I, I, I just need to get here because it's the same for a minute. It's like, you know, I had a young man speak with me a couple months ago about this stuff. And he said to me, Joel, he said, I have these desires. I'm same-sex attracted. I can't shake it. I've tried. He goes, I know what the Bible says. He says, so if that's the Bible's true, will I be denied that romantic love experience that other people have? And your heart wants this, it breaks. And you think to yourself, man. But the answer is yes. That's, that's the harsh truth of it. The same way that, I'm a married man. I'm married to my wife. If I'm overcome with desire, if I'm overcome with a sexual desire for another woman, just because I feel that way, and that feeling can be very real, doesn't mean I get to give in to my feeling because that would be sexual immorality. It means I have to deny my flesh, take up my cross, and follow Jesus. I have made a covenant between God and my wife that I would stay with her. And just because I have a feeling doesn't mean I have to give in to that feeling. It's the same way with same-sex attraction. You may feel that way, that may be overcoming, and you cannot shake it. But I want to tell you, part of your responsibility to honor God with your body that He bought at a price is to deny the flesh, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. The Christian life is not of self-gratification. It's self-denial. We don't give in to this new age ideology that says empty your mind, do whatever makes you feel good. We believe in giving our lives to Jesus, having our mind renewed by the Word of God, denying yourself and follow Jesus. All that to say God's purpose and plan for sexual activity 
is between, is, is reserved for the marriage bed. God's design for marriage is that it would be between a man and a woman. Are we okay? Whew, okay, we're almost there. Um, part of God's plan for sexual intimacy and activity is enjoyment. If you've been married for five seconds, you would know that. If you've been living in sexual morality for five seconds, you would know it's enjoyable. There is pleasure attached to sexual activity. And that's part of God's purpose and plan that we would have marriage beds that are pleasurable, that we would give ourselves to our wives and our wives would give ourselves to our husbands and we wouldn't deny our husband of our due rights and vice versa because your body's not your own, but your wife has authority over your body, you have authority over your wife. There's this beautiful picture in God's, there is an enjoyment within the marriage bed in fact, with sexual activity that is part of God's plan. We, we don't want to create a culture where we demonize sex for our young people all the way till they get married and then they have to rewire their mind to go from sex is evil to sex is wonderful. We just need to not be afraid to have the conversations at the appropriate time and age to teach them the good things about it, but to have messages like this where we can discuss and teach them the results and the things that happen outside of God's perfect plan for marriage and sexual activity. And so part of it is pleasure. Part of God's plan for sexual activity is procreation. It's to make babies. I love children. God loves children. He tells us to have a full quiver. A lot of us aren't listening there. Full quiver is like how many arrows you have in your quiver. And there's seven. I'm not close to a full. I've got two quivers. Uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, but you, it's amazing that God's plan, part of God's plan for sexual activity and His design was procreation. It's amazing how the spirit of the world wants to kill our babies. It's amazing how He fights the very thing that God has created, the, the purity of what He's done. It's to create children, to multiply, subdue the earth, make babies, multiply, okay? And of course, this morning, for the sake of time, we can't unpack everything today in, in broad stroke, uh, in, sorry, in, in depth, but we're going to go over these things quickly in the time that we have. And so there is some things that generally what God's plan and purpose is for sexual activity, it's between, uh, it's for the marriage bed, that the marriage bed is reserved for a man and a woman. It's for enjoyment. It's to make babies. And it's to also give us a prophetic picture of the unity of Christ and His church, that two have become one. And what God has united, let no man separate. Amen? So that's number one. Number two is this. There's, uh, number two is, is the problem with sexual immorality. So there's the purpose and plan for sexual activity and sexual intimacy. But then there's the problem of sexual immorality. And the problem of sexual immorality, which is any and all sexual activity outside of the context of marriage between a man and a woman, is that it leads to brokenness. It leads to pain. It leads to shame. We read before in, in, in the book of Corinthians, it says the sin that you commit sexually is not the same as other sins. Now we think every sin is the same. Ultimately, the result of sin is the same, but it says that the sin that you commit sexually is different to all other sins, but it's a sin against your own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And so the problem of sexual immorality, the thing that God's trying to protect us from is the pain. It is the shame, it's the brokenness when you give yourself in such an intimate way to a person who is not committed to you, committed to your life. And in fact, if I can be blatantly honest, is genuinely just using you, whether consciously or subconsciously, for satisfaction, the result is pain. The result is brokenness. The result is sexually transmitted diseases. The result is, is heartache. The result is prostitution. The result is abuse. The result is broken families. We, you know, there's, part of sexual immorality is adultery. When a man or a woman is unfaithful to their partner, that creates broken homes. Part of broken homes is children without fathers and, and children without mothers. Part of the problem 
of sexual immorality is the outrageous rates of abortion that are happening and the laws that are being passed all around the world. It's just the problem of sexual immorality. There's a result of our sin because sin leads to death. And this is the problem. This is why God says, flee from sexual immorality. I want to protect my people from that that is worse so I can preserve them for that which is better. Yeah, wow. I want to protect my people. The next thing is this. There's the punishment of sexual immorality. God's punishment for sexual immorality. The word punishment feels so aggressive, doesn't it? 2021. Punishment. But the truth of the matter is this. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 says this, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? So wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. I believe it's so important in our world to recognize that the Bible tells us that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. And now we're about to go through a list of wrongdoers. But in our world, the reason is like, don't be deceived is because people are being deceived. People are twisting Scripture. People are looking. And I believe often out of good conscience trying to help people because people are struggling. But do not be deceived that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So God, the Bible tells us that the wrongdoers, the sexually immoral, and for today's topic, the sexually immoral and the adulterers and, and, and men who have sex with men, it's all in sexual immorality, will not inherit the kingdom of God. We just have to be super cautious in how we talk about this because if error equals I don't inherit the kingdom of God, then as we started this message, we got a whole bunch of Christians sitting in their pews that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the other ones who didn't put their hand up, they were lying, so they also won't inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> but the thing here is, it's not someone who sins will not inherit the kingdom of God because we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that the struggle is real. We are tempted. We are tried. We know we have a deceiver called the devil whose assignment is to destroy our life. But those wrongdoers are not those who have fallen in sexual immorality. It, are, it is those who are living in unrepentant sexual immorality. So the punishment for an unrepentant life in sexual immorality is that you are clearly denying the deity of Christ in your life, the lordship of Christ in your life. The fruit of your following Jesus will be found that you look like Jesus. It's an unrepentant way of living that leads to not inheriting the kingdom of God. Just because it's uncomfortable doesn't make it not true. That is the punishment for sexual immorality. But that leads us to the next point that is this. God's redemption for the sexually immoral. The worship team can come. God's redemption for the sexually immoral. You see, because a unrepentant lifestyle of sin, not just in sexual immorality, but in sin in general, leads us to a place of not inheriting the kingdom of God, we have the grace of God poured out in the person of Jesus. And Jesus says, if anyone would come to me, I will give them rest. God's redemption for the sexually immoral. 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. 1 John says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, redemption is a result of repentance. 
You repentance is acknowledging the sin in your life. Right now, you may not be living in sexual sin, but some of you might be. And the responsibility to walk in redemption is repentance. And repentance means to change the way that you think. Turn from the way you're going to Jesus. Repentance is not say sorry, slip up again, say sorry, slip up again. That's not how it works. Repentance is a change of heart and you change the way you're going. That doesn't mean you won't error along the way of repentance. It just means your heart has shifted. You acknowledge your sin and you confess your sin to Jesus and He is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin. Every sexual sin, every partner you've been with, every screen you've looked at, every time you've been unfaithful with your husband or wife. He's faithful and just to forgive those who confess. It's God's redemption and it comes through repentance. But you see, because of sexual sin, because of sexual immorality, there are those who have personally made the decision to engage in sexual activity, sexual immorality, but there are also those who have been victims of sexual immorality, whether it be through things like abuse. Whatever that situation is for some people, but the problem with that is that sin has results and sometimes you are the victim of that sexual immorality. And I talk about, but what about and you, you, this picture of am, am I okay? Am, am, have I sinned? And the truth is, there's a statement that says, don't let sin against you produce sin in you. But what happens, and often people who have been hurt by sexual sin end up living a lifestyle of sexual sin. And in doing this, there's a way that Christ is so gracious, He's so kind. Firstly, is there's a way to break out of that and that is to forgive those who have hurt you. That doesn't mean they're right. Doesn't mean they should have done it. It means that you're finding a place to remove yourself from the captivity of what they've done to you. And if that's where it stopped, then praise God. But if the result of your Abuse has been sexual immorality, a lifestyle of sexual immorality. That's where you have the responsibility to repent, turn to Jesus for your redemption. Which leads us to the last thought of is God's restoration for the redeemed. Because we can come to Jesus and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm genuinely changing my life. I'm turning from this way to this way. But who knows, that doesn't always mean the baggage has fallen off your shoulders. You've changed your life, but there's pain in your heart. There's pain in your life. For some, there's physical things wrong with their body because of result of sexual immorality through sexually transmitted diseases. AIDS is a pure result of sexual sin. And there's these things and we're redeemed. We've turned to Jesus. We're following Jesus. But can I tell you, I believe in a God of miracles. I believe of a God who can heal your body. I believe in a God who can heal your mind. I believe in a God who doesn't just save you from your sins, but restores your heart. He restores your soul. We said it before, sexual sin is not the unforgivable sin. Repent, turn to Jesus, walk with Jesus and let His grace, let His power, let His mercy restore the redeemed today. Our, the Bible says, in, 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 I'll read it quickly, Corinthians, it goes on to say, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says in 11, and that was, sorry, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. The old is your old life, which is your tower of testimony to tell the world that God took you from darkness to light, from broken to healed, from sick to restored. He redeems, He's right, He restores the redeemed so we can be a testimony to the world of God's purpose and plan for sexual activity because He's protecting us from something worse, to preserve us for something better, but if we've had the worst, the good thing about grace is the better is still available. 
Wow, what an amazing word from Pastor Joel Ramsey. I hope you guys were impacted by it as much as I was. Uh, but in a moment, I'm about to pray a prayer. And if you would love to receive Jesus into your life, I would love for you to re repeat this prayer after me. Say this, Dear Jesus, thank you for your love for me. Please forgive me of all my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe in you, and from this day forward, I will choose to follow you. Amen. Man, if you made that decision, all of heaven is celebrating with you right now. And just in a moment, Zara is about to tell you some next steps to help you grow in your faith. If you made a decision today, I want to say congratulations. All of heaven is rejoicing alongside you and alongside us. And here at City Point, we have three steps to help you out on the journey you have just begun with God. Number one, keep coming to church. We'd love to see you every Sunday right here for our online services. And then when we're able to be back in person, we'd love to have you join us in person. Number two, join a life group. Life groups are a place where we can draw closer together in community and connect with God together. If you haven't already, I encourage you to text the number on the screen or DM us through any of our social media so we can help you get connected into a life group. Step three, do growth track. Growth track is a three-step process where we get to have a deeper understanding of God, learn more about ourselves, and also hear the vision of our church. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to sign up either by texting the number on the screen or messaging us through any of our social media accounts. Once again, if you made a decision today, I want to say congratulations. And we don't want you to walk this journey alone. So here at City Point, we have a number on the screen that you can text or a link in the chat. And we'd love you to contact us so we can get alongside you and help you out on your new journey. Here at City Point, we believe that generosity is in the heart of the believer and that giving is just one part of our worship to God. There are two ways you can give here at City Point. Either you can text City Point to 818 or click the link in the chat. If you're new to City Point or maybe you've been here for a while, we'd love to connect with you and have you join our church family. So please click the link in the chat or text connect to the number on the screen. Well, thank you so much, church, for joining us for our night service. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope you guys got a lot out of it as well. Uh, but before you head off, just a reminder of the City Point Worship Behold um, collection and merch launch, as well as next week we have Pastor Sheldon Brown from Kingdom City Church preaching in the morning, and Pastor Ben is going to be preaching at night. So we will see you there. I hope you guys have a great week, and see you next Sunday.